Hello and welcome to the distinguished faculty address and thanks particularly for coming out on this less than ideal weather day. Oh. I'm Fran McSweeney and I'm substituting for the provosts who are at the regents meeting. So at any rate, uh, this afternoon's address is a wonderful example of showcase, our week of celebrating the wonderful achievements of our faculty, staff, and students at WSU. If you've been attending Showcase, you know that already this week we've recognized uh, graduate student accomplishments, the books that have been authored by WSU uh, faculty members, and we've heard from uh, the recipient of the Emeritus Society Legacy of Excellence Award winner, uh, Dr. Dr. Robert Ackerman. He told us about his uh, wonderful archaeological research in Alaska, so I hope you all heard it. And I hope you all see you tomorrow at uh, the morning's celebration of research scholarship and creative activities um, in the academic showcase and GPSA Expo in the Cub Senior Ballroom. It's a wonderful morning of activities, lots of energy. Everyone seems to enjoy it. And tomorrow evening, I hope you'll join us for the Celebrating Excellence Recognition Banquet, where we'll celebrate this year's faculty and staff award recipients, including Dr. Skinner, our newly promoted and tenured faculty members, and our 2015 patent awardees. Finally, we'll conclude on Monday afternoon with Circa, the undergraduate uh, presentation of research. So, turning to the distinguished faculty address, it's a long-standing tradition at WSU, stretching back over more than 50 years to the first award given in 1958. If you browse the list of distinguished faculty address award presenters, you'll find a who's who of WSU's leading researchers, scholars, and teachers. Uh, the honor recognizes exceptional members of the WSU faculty. They're individuals whose achievements in research, scholarship, and teaching place them in the front ranks of their discipline. Criteria for this honor include national and international prominence, for original contributions to one's discipline, receipt of external support when available, national or international service, and achievements in undergraduate and graduate education. I'd like to take just a moment to thank the members of this year's Distinguished Faculty Address Award Selection Committee for their time and dedication in selecting this honoree. Uh, the committee was chaired by Greg Yazinitsky, and the members included Susie Appleyard, Linda Bradley, Sue Dexheimer, Tim Kohler, Mike Wolcott, and Todd Martin. This year's Distinguished Faculty Address presenter rose to the top of the nominations with his commitment to research and dedication to the advancement of Washington State University. To help me introduce that, him, let me welcome to the stage Dean Darrell DeWald, uh, Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. Thank you, Vice Provost McSweeney. So it's my privilege to introduce one of Washington State University's brightest stars, a distinguished professor whose research is a magnificent example of the power of inquiry, the importance of foundational discovery, and the pursuit of excellence. His groundbreaking work has been highlighted in documentaries by BBC, Smithsonian, and PBS, and was selected by Discover Magazine as among the top 100 discoveries in both 2005 and 2007. He became a fellow of the AAAS in 2012 and received a Smithsonian Ingenuity Award in 2013. Dr. Skinner is a native of rural Oregon. Excuse me, he earned his PhD in biochemistry right here at Washington State University, spending countless hours in laboratories just across the street. After graduation, he traveled east to complete postdoctoral fellowships at the University of Toronto, a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Toronto, and then south the following year to accept a faculty appointment in pharmacology at Vanderbilt University. In 1991, he returned went to the West Coast to join the faculty of one of the top medical research universities in the country the University of California at San Francisco, with a dual appointment in physiology and reproductive sciences. 
Then in 1996, we were fortunate that he returned to WSU and took the reins of the new Center for Reproductive Biology. It was then and remains today one of the largest university-wide based reproductive research centers in the world. Dr. Skinner spent the next decade studying how genes turn on and off in ovaries and testes and how cells in these organs interact. His vision and his leadership led to the creation of the WSU Center for Integrated Biology and a marked increase in scientific, educational, and industrial collaborations. Dr. Skinner's groundbreaking findings in the emerging field of epigenetics have opened new scientific windows on genetic inheritance and predisposition to disease. And they're helping us to understand better the consequences of chemical exposure in the environment. As with any scientific discovery, a commitment to research excellence and an openness for healthy debate go hand in hand. It's an arena befitting Dr. Skinner's approach. And he's quoted as saying, if you're not doing something controversial, you're not doing something important. Dr. Skinner embodies the university's mission to advance, extend, and apply knowledge that promotes the common good and empowers communities. We are very pleased to have him at WSU today. Please join me in giving Dr. Michael Skinner a warm welcome as he presents the distinguished faculty um, presentation. Well, thanks very much, Fran and Daryl. Appreciate it. I want to also thank all of the faculty, both in the School of Biological Sciences that supported this and then the other faculty that actually pushed it forward. I appreciate it. Uh, this is truly an honor, and also all of you for coming. Uh, this is truly an honor because I remember this, these series of talks when I was a graduate student here, and since I've been a faculty here, uh, went them, seen them pretty regularly. And it truly is sort of the cream of the crop over the years. And so this is really a great honor for me. Um, one of the things that generally happened at many of the past distinguished uh, address was um, some fairly major stage operations. And so uh, uh, in, when I was a grad student, I was privileged to actually see when I just finished that Ralph Young gave his talk, very nice, a great talk. Lynn Randall probably has the epitome of it. She gave a she gave a whole theatrical sort of thing on how proteins, actually chaperone proteins, work in protein folding. It was pretty impressive. Yeah. Uh, recently then, um, Mick Smearden did one uh, about 10 years ago where he had these wires and ropes and so forth where he showed how DNA actually wrapped around a nucleosome and DNA repair occurred. That was pretty impressive too. So for me, I'm gonna be a little bit less dramatic, but I do have some observation here. This was given to me by a fellow in the lab. She got it, and she was a native of Belarus and, and came home one time. And she's actually labeled all these generationally. And so essentially, this is a very good example of what I'm gonna talk about. And uh, the concept is that disease may not just be what you're exposed to when you're uh, when you're a, an adult or growing up and so forth, but this may actually come from your ancestors. The little one actually dropped here. <laughs> so uh, essentially what I'm gonna talk about is if you're a gestating female, that you're gonna affect your great-great-grandchildren. That concept is relatively novel, and this is not genetic has nothing to do necessarily with genetic mutations and so forth. So this is a very novel thing called non-genetic inheritance, and I'll discuss that thoroughly in the talk. So what I'm going to talk about are these ancestral ghosts in your genes. Essentially, it is truly what your ancestors had in terms of exposures and changing this molecular element that I'm going to talk about epigenetics during the talk how this is going to affect not only you as you grow and get uh, age and get disease, but also your great-grandchildren or great-great-grandchildren, okay? 
And so what I'm going to talk about is epigenetic transgenerational inheritance and how this may be one of the primary conditions of why we are susceptible to develop disease. So the reason this was a relatively controversial topic was this paradigm called genetic determinism is the principal paradigm in biology that's existed for well over 100 years. This is the predominant paradigm in every field of biology, whether it's evolution, disease etiology, anything you can think about. It's always linked to genetic sequence, and it's thought that when the genetic sequence is abnormal, the expression's abnormal, the physiology is abnormal, such that you know, the biology shifts and you have a susceptibility to develop disease. In fact, when they sequenced the genome in 2000, that concept was now that we have the map, we're going to figure out how all disease works. And that, 15 years later, hasn't worked out. And there's a reason for that. It's not just DNA sequence. But that concept is called genetic determinism, that basically everything comes from this DNA sequence only. Okay? And it's not that this is not absolutely critical, it's absolutely critical for biology and everything. It's just a small piece of a much bigger story. The reason we know that is, or we had tints of that is, probably about 50, 60 years ago, epidemiologists have been telling us things are happening in disease that we cannot explain through genetics. If you go anywhere in the world, every region has its different frequencies. In Japan, they have very high stomach disease and very low prostate disease for males. In North America, we have exceedingly high levels of prostate disease and very low stomach disease. If you take someone from Japan at the age, before the age of five, move them to North America, guess what? They develop the North American regional sort of disease frequencies. I'm sorry, this can't be genetics. It has to be an environmentally induced phenomena for the two regions. Okay. If you take and look at the genetic component of the diseases, these are through a thing called a genome-wide association studies, looking for mutations. What we find is, and they've looked at most of the major diseases, and in many cases, they have found genetic mutations. The problem is, it's generally in less than 1% of the disease population. So 100 people have breast cancer, only one has the mutation. So what about the other 99%? There are a few diseases that are minor in terms of frequency that are 100% genetic. And so those have been driving this genetic sort of thing, but this lack of demutations in the major diseases has been a problem to explain a disease etiology. Okay. And then there's a, this phenomena that's occurred over the past 25, 30 years. Most disease is now increasing almost tenfold in the past 20 to 30 years. Autism has gone up 15-fold. Okay. Many diseases are just rampantly going up. Now, I've said that before, and people really don't really grasp it. So now I'm going to show you this figure that came out in 2015, a major study, 188 developed countries around the world. They looked at their general population. They separated them according to age. They looked for the number of chronic disease in each individual. What they found was majority of the population over the age of 70, there was no healthy individuals. Everybody had at least one or more chronic diseases even at the age of zero to nine, the black here is the healthy disease. The rest of it, are the healthy individuals with no disease. So if you don't think that the population in the world is going through the roof in terms of disease, uh, you're just not paying attention. So there needs to be a reason for this rampant increase. So this is another thing that says that it can't just be genetics because there's no genetic mechanism that could explain that phenomena. It has to be more of an environmentally induced phenomena. If you look at identical twins that have essentially the same epigenetics, or excuse me, the same genetics, as they grow up, more often than not, across the board, those twins get different diseases. If it was all based just on genetics, they should get the same diseases. We don't see that in the vast majority of twins that are looked at. There's hundreds and hundreds of environmental factors that are directly linked to disease. The vast majority of those cannot change DNA sequence. They're not mutagenic, yet basically they're causing the disease. So how is it they do that? 
And then I'll talk about uh, just a very end on some evolutionary stuff where there's rapid evolutionary events that are difficult to explain, particularly if it's environmentally induced with just classic genetics. So the concept is there needs to be something else influencing that genome or DNA sequence activity. Not that this is not important, but there has to be something else that's potentially environmentally responsive. And this, which I'll discuss, is epigenetics. And I'll describe that in a minute, so don't worry about that. But epigenetics fills those voids and, and, and basically provides solutions for a number of the failures of genetic determinism. You can't really separate them. You won't ever have, I think, a genetic-only process, and you won't have an epigenetic-only process. These two things are intertwined, and you can't really separate them. And so if you're going to try to understand something, you need to think about both. So epigenetics is described as molecular factors or processes that are around the DNA that actually can regulate genome activity or what genes are on and off. Okay? And this has to be completely independent of DNA sequence. It doesn't matter what the DNA sequence is. If it was dependent on sequence, it would be genetics. So epigenetics doesn't care what the sequence is in terms of regulating the genome activity. Okay? That distinguishes the two. And this is also mitotically stable. So when a cell grows into two daughter cells, not only is the DNA replicated for both, the epigenetics is replicated for both. So it basically passes on the epigenetics from cell to cell. If it wasn't stable, it would be irrelevant. So it has to be mitotically stable as well. So it's these molecular factors around the DNA that regulate how the DNA works, independent of DNA sequence, and that it's mitotically stable. So that's epigenetics. So, for the past 20, 30 years, we've been looking at that, what some of the mechanisms were. In the 80s, basically, we found that DNA methylation, these small methyl groups that get covalently attached to the DNA, can actually regulate genes going up and down, independent of the sequence. Histone modifications, these DNA is wrapped around these, these core histones, called a nucleosome. And the chemical modifications of these histone proteins can actually change, again, how DNA works and how genes are turned on and off. In terms of chromatin structure, if the DNA is coiled and looped or stuck to the nuclear matrix or something, it can change, again, how genes are turned on and off. And the more recent one is non-coding RNAs, these really small RNAs that basically can regulate gene expression independent of sequence as well. Okay? So these are the four types of epigenetic marks that are known. So, so with that as an intro, we did a series of experiments to actually see what role this epigenetics might have for the disease and came across a fairly surprising observation. We exposed a gestating female here. This is, we, we use a rat model. This gestating female, we exposed it to a, a number of different environmental toxicants. And then we basically would breed those animals out for four or five generations. And what we found was there was disease not only in the, one, the fetus that was exposed, but all subsequent generations. So I'll describe that here in a minute. So that basically it turns out to cause this transgenerational, this generational thing where the mother gets exposed, the fetus is then directly exposed, and basically it keeps going generationally. So that was an odd observation, and it didn't fit normal Mendelian thinking. So the first one that we looked at was a very most commonly used fungicide worldwide called vinclozolin. Here's the structure of vinclozolin. And vinclozolin is sprayed in the, in the uh, fruit and vegetable industry. It's, one of the, it's the most commonly used fungicide. And here it's heavily being sprayed on the grapes that are used in the wine industry. And, and here's the fellow spraying vinclozolin. This is an antiandrogenic substance. And in other words, this substance blocks the ability of testosterone, the male steroid hormone to act. So it's called an endocrine disruptor. Okay? And it had been shown that exposure of this actually influenced how the gonad would function, particularly the testis. And so that's why we studied it. So we used vinclozolin and exposed that gestating female. And what we found is the F1 generation, the fetus that was exposed, when it was born and then grew up to be about uh, 120 days or you know, basically a young adult, what happened was the cells that were in the testis, called spermatogenic cells that are going to turn, eventually turn into sperm, a, vast, a large percentage of them started to, to die. 
undergo what's called apoptosis, cell death. Then this animal was bred to the next generation, and we saw the same phenomena. And this kept going out for, gener for four generations. And then what we did is we outbred the male to a wild-type female, and we got the disease again. But when we outbred the female, we lost it. So this shows that it was going through the male sperm from generation to generation. The male transmitted disease. 90% of the female, or males at each generation had this apoptotic sort of cell effect. They were still fertile when they were younger, but they became infertile oftentimes when they became older. So we could breed them, but we basically, they had lower sperm counts and things. So this was our first transgenerational phenomena, and this did not follow normal genetics. Normally, when you get a disease, you have a certain frequency. As you bring in new genetics to the next generation, you get a decline in the disease frequency. The new genetics again, you get a decline. So usually within three or four generations, you basically lose the phenotype. If you bring in wild type, it doesn't have the phenotype. And that's called uh, segregation, but basically it's a genetic Mendelian rule. This was in, against that rule because we saw 90% at each generation with no decline. So we knew that it probably wasn't going to be a genetic phenomenon. Okay? So when these animals were aged out to a year, this gestating female, at the F1 generation, we also saw mammary tumors in the males, which you don't anymore see, prostate disease over 50%, kidney disease, test disease, immune abnormalities. At the next generation, remember the only thing exposed was this gestating f female here. We saw an increase in all those diseases. In the, thir in the third generation, the same sort of thing. And then, and basically the fourth generation is shown here. So there's a massive amount of disease. 87 to 90 percent of the animals had more than one disease. And so this is a very high disease frequency that we saw just from this gestating female exposure three or four generations later. Okay? So this is when uh, we call it, this is a transgenerational disease phenotype. So then we thought, well, maybe this is something unique just about being close on. Maybe vinclozolin was something unique. So we tried a whole series of other factors. We tried, we took another antiandrogenic substance which is similar to action called flutamide. Flutamide is a pharmaceutical used to treat prostate disease. When we did this, the F1 generation got disease, but it was lost after that, so it didn't have a transgenerational. It's the only substance we've ever tested that doesn't give us a transgenerational, which is really nice to have at least one negative. And so then uh, when we look at something like dioxin, the substance that was in Agent Orange, uh, in terms of a toxin, and also an industrial contaminant, it caused a uh, transgenerational generation. Bisphenol A, the thing that's in these plastics and so forth we drink out of, uh, also caused. Uh, the jet fuel, the hydrocarbon mixtures we're exposed to, did the same thing. Insect repellent and, and, uh, uh, insect repellent and and a pesticide used in humans called permethrin and DEET, which is the most common thing used in humans to prevent mosquitoes, did not cause an F1 generation, but did cause an F3 generation. So it caused a transgeneration. And then DDT caused a major effect, and the replacement for DDT, methoxychlor, did the same. So all of these different compounds, and we selected them because they acted very differently in terms of their mechanism of action. All of them promoted the transgenerational. Okay. So it wasn't just a unique thing with vinclozolin. Just to give you, I'm going to give you one example. This is polycystic ovarian disease, where the ovary develops in a female, as they age, very large cysts. Okay, and here's small cysts, and here's a very large cyst. And these graphs just show that in the F1 generation, the dire generation directly exposed, the only thing that really did it was bisphenol A, the thing from plastics. But by the F3 generation, every single substance we tested in 90% of the females developed polycystic ovarian syndrome. Okay? And, and, and if you don't know, in the female population today, the number one reproductive problem in fema human females pretty much worldwide is polycystic ovarian disease. It can be up to 20% of the females in a population depending on where you live. So this is a significant disease of female. Prevents, it reduces fertility, causes endocrine abnormalities, and can be painful as well. And so this just showed one example of all of the substances causing this same disease. So the diseases are listed here, whole series of them. We had, we had male uh, diseases, let's say apoptosis in the testis, 
uh, with female diseases, prostate disease, mammary tumors, uh, significant both in males and females, a whole series of behavioral effects, anxiety increases, uh, preeclampsia, which is another female, premature ovarian failure, uh, premature puberty in females, but not so much in males, and obesity in between 10 and 50 percent, depending on what kind of a uh, factor was actually inducing it. Okay, so a whole series of diseases that are fairly common in our population today in humans. So, for about at least five or six years, we were pretty much the only ones that had shown the transgenerational. So when you say something like there's a form of non-genetic inheritance for the first time, you get a lot of flack, and so I did. Luckily, after about f five to seven years, other st scientists started getting into the field. And now there's dozens and dozens of labs that study transgenerational phenomena. And here's just a few of the chemicals that have been shown. In addition, nutrition turned out to be a major. Caloric restriction or high-fat diet was a major driver for transgenerational disease. Temperatures such as drought in plants, uh, where sort of smoking or alcohol promoted transgenerational. Stress, it turned out, recently has been shown. Maternal stress, early fetal stress, or early postnatal stress will do the same thing. Even in adults, stress, it'll promote epigenetic shifts. And this has now been shown in plants, flies, worms, fish, rodents, pigs, humans, and more recently in birds. So this is a highly conserved biological phenomena, which is what you'd expect if it was going to be important. If it was only in one species, then, of course, it really wouldn't be that essential. But it's pretty much every place they've looked, they've found it. Okay? So now it's not so much whether it occurs, it's the nuances of how it's working that's the issue. Okay? So when you, study, when you still look at a transgenerational thing, if you had the female here that was actually exposed when she was pregnant, the fema, F0 female is exposed. The F1 fetus, the fetus that's going to be born and grow up, uh, is directly exposed, and the germline, the sperm or the egg that's in that fetus, is also directly exposed. So you have to go out to at least three generations to be able to get a transgenerational, okay, or farther. If you're an adult, non-pregnant female or male, the F0 is directly exposed, and your germline that you have is also directly exposed. So you only have to get out to the F2, the grandchildren, to get a transgenerational. This is important because there were a few studies that only went to F2 for a long time. And so you just need to go out another generation to show that it's going to be transgenerational. Okay? So that's why most of the data that I'll show you is, is F3 generation, because it's a definitive F transgenerational generation. So the mechanism that we looked at was DNA methylation. So there's a small methyl group stuck on the cysteine that sort of sits on the DNA, and it has to be next to a guanine, so it's a CG residue. And there's a little methyl group gets stuck on there, and there's an enzyme called methyltransferase that'll stick it on there. Okay. And during, meth during that me DNA methylation, it's no known to exist for a while. Upon fertilization of the egg and the sperm coming together, one of the things that happens is the DNA methylation of the DNA that's contributed by both the father and the mother that comes together to form what's called a zygote, the early embryo. During that process, within a couple cell divisions, the vast majority of DNA methylation is erased. Okay? And so it's very, very low levels. This is what creates an embryonic stem cell. This gives you the cell in the embryo by simply removing the DNA methylation that now can turn into anything. Okay? It's totipotent. So essentially, stem cells are controlled through this epigenetic process. And so then, it, when the embryo starts to develop, it gets remethylated in a cell-specific manner for all the cells it's going to generate. Okay? Now, there's a set of genes called imprinted genes that are protected from that DNA methylation erasure. Okay? Now, the other time during methylation is during sex determination, which we were studying fairly extensively. So there's a primordial germ cell, which is the stem cell for the germline, that gets demethylated, and then it's remethylated in a male or specific manner, or male or female specific manner, at the time of sex termination. Okay? So when we did most of our exposures, this is when it happened, during that sex termination. It was the tail end of this DNA methylation erasure and the beginning of the remethylation. So what we proposed is we reprogrammed the epigenetics, the DNA methylation, such that it was different in the germline, and then it was protected or imprinted 
and protect her from the demethylation. Therefore, it gets transferred from generation to generation. So this is called epigenetic inheritance, essentially. Okay? So that's what we had to need to, we needed to actually look and see. So we did a, a fairly advanced molecular procedure, and don't worry about this complex. But basically, here's your chromosomes, and here's the size of the chromosome in terms of megabases. And all of these red arrows are where, where we found a differential methylation site between the control and enclosal in F3 generation sperm. So this actually showed that we changed the epigenetic programming of the sperm and it became permanently programmed at three generations it was still there. Okay? And, these, and we saw about 200 sites genome-wide and this gave us a fingerprint. Now the, to our surprise, if we looked at all of the other chemical compounds, the pesticides, jet fuel, DDT, and so forth, each one gave us a change in the epigenetics. These epi mutations is what we call them. But they turned out to be exposure specific. There was no overlap, essentially no overlap with all these agents. What this means is we might be able to actually have a signature for environmental exposures. So you could tell what your great grandmother was exposed to that's going to affect you by simply looking for that signature. Okay? And it's different for different compounds. So that could really revolutionize the field of toxicology by having a marker for exposure. Now, we now had about only about 200 sites that were being transferred through the germline, yet in, that, in this picture here, there were like 5,000 genes affected. So how does that work? And so what we looked at, looked at these things, and we found that these, uh, the DNA methylation uh, uh, difference was in these CPG deserts where there was these CPGs next to each other, and near them there were these uh, uh, sites in the DNA where they, where they bend DNA, essentially. And so this is, all of the sites had this sort of characteristics, and here just shows one example. So there's a very unique signature, genomic feature associated with these sites. Now, when we looked at the effects on the gene expression, we took these F3 generations, we looked at 11 different tissues from males and females, and again, we ran looking at what genes were changed between the control and the vinclozolin, and we saw each tissue had a unique signature and again, no overlap. So every tissue had a unique signature in its, in it, in its expression profile. And there were about 5,000 genes that were changed here. Yet we're only having about 200 sites going forward. So how does 200 sites regulate 5,000 genes? What we found, if we looked at where those, where those genes were on the, on the genome, oh, here's again all your chromosomes, here's the size of the chromosome, what we found is they all started clustering together. The red ones are the male clusters and the green ones are the female clusters. Many of them are the same, but some of them are sex specific. So they basically clustered together. So it turns out, if you look at some of these clusters, these are clusters are two to five megabase in size. They're very, very large. And there can be 50 to 100 genes in this region. We call these things epigenetic control regions. And the differential methylation site sits here and appears to have the capacity to regulate this whole region. So how does that work? It turns out these non-coding RNAs actually are, ex are influenced by these uh, epimutations. And they have the ability to act at a distance, a megabase or two, in either direction to regulate how genes are turned on and off. So this is called an epigenetic regulation of gene expression. It no longer requires just the promoter of a gene next to it. You can actually look at it a megabase away, and it can affect that gene. So this is a sort of a new form of gene expression regulation that we didn't really know before. And I feel epigenetics is probably going to provide a significant component to our understanding of regulation of the genome activity beyond just the sequence associated with a promoter in a gene. Okay? So the way this works is you have an environmental factor that actually influences this gestating female. The fetus then gets a reprogramming of its germline and it gets, it gets imprinted. As, it, as the fetus then is born and grows up to become an adult, then basically this gets passed on to the next generation. The, the germline actually passes this, the egg or the sperm, to the next generation. Now this is the kind of unique thing. If the germline is carrying with it an epigenetic shift, then it's going down. The embryonic stem cells now has an epigenetic shift. Every single tissue that's developed from that embryonic stem cell now has an epigenetic shift and a change in its transcriptome. 
And so every cell we've looked at and every tissue we've looked at has a shift in its transcriptome and its epigenome. Those tissues that are sensitive to that shift have a susceptibility to get disease. Those that aren't, won't, okay? As this individual becomes an adult, the sperm epimutation is still there, it gets transferred to the next generation, and the thing repeats, okay? So this is called epigenetic transgenerational inheritance. It's sort of a novel, non-genetic form of inheritance that, we re that is a dramatic effect of the, of the environment, okay? So I'm just gonna give you one example. In this, so this epigenetic transgenerational, here's a female that was exposed. We, I give, the example I gave here is DDT, okay? In the first generation, we really don't see any change in obesity. We, do, we see a few diseases, but nothing, nothing major, okay? Three generations later, 50% of the female and male population have obesity, okay? From this ancestral exposure, three generations later. Now, if you don't know, in the 1950s, the population in, in the US or the North America was dramatically exposed to DDT, exceedingly high doses, okay, for over 10 years. There's not a gestating female that didn't get exposure in the 1950s. This wasn't possible because of the level of DDT that was being used. F uh, obesity rates in the 1950s was 5% or less, depending on where you lived. Today, it was reported we now have a 45% obesity rate in North America and parts of Europe as well. So could it be that the obesity susceptibility we have today was due to those ancestral exposures? And we are three generations from the 1950s now. So what we're suggesting is the exposure doesn't really promote the disease, it promotes the susceptibility. And we actually have seen animals that they'll have litter mates that aren't obese and the ones that are. And so you have this susceptibility due to this epigenetic shift that gets transferred from generation to generation. And it's built over this three, three generation period. Okay. So we have these environmental exposures causing these generational phenotypes. The, the, the critical time we originally identified was that sex determination of the gonad when the testis or ovary were developed when it was a sensitive time for exposure during that germline programming. But we now know that about three, three or four different labs in the past couple years have shown that they can take adult males in particular, expose them to things, and promote transgenerational effects because of that germline exposure of, in the adult male. So far, females are not as sensitive, adult, adult females that are not pregnant, okay? But the males are far more sensitive. In, term, in terms of, there's a concept called the fetal basis or early life basis of adult onset disease. So what's going on? early in life as a fetus or early uh, after birth is really what's going to cause your disease susceptibility later in life. There's lots of examples of that. Genetics has a difficult time explaining that, but epigenetics gives us a really nice mechanism on how that occurs. Okay. And, this, and this basically, so epigenetics probably will be a significant component, component of disease etiology, which really didn't really appreciate before. Now, the daily exposures that you get are not gonna generally affect your germline, okay? But they can affect your somatic cells, all the other cells in your body except your sperm or egg. The same mechanism is affecting their function as well. So essentially, early in development, let's say the fetal period, you have these stem cells, or undifferentiated cells, that undergo a genetic, a genetic development stage in terms of gene expression and so forth. At the same time, the epigenetics is also going through this cascade of changes to give you a fully differentiated cell that's normal. If there's an environmental exposure at this early time, it really can't change the genetic sequence, but it can change the epigenetics that gets programmed. And then this appears and gives you an environmentally modified form, a differentiated state, that gives you a different gene expression profile and a disease susceptibility. So even though it's not generational, it's somewhat to the same mechanism going on, okay? So this is called epigenetic transgenerational inheritance. In terms of toxicology, none of the factors that I talked about did we do risk assessment. So I can't say these are really bad compounds. But if you don't, if you're not only, uh, if you're no, don't, no, aren't only concerned about the individual exposed in their disease, 
but all of a sudden now you can actually influence subsequent generations to come, the biohazards of these things need to be significantly increased in terms of your thoughts. And, and particularly things like how their government controls what should or shouldn't be on the feet and, and uh, uh, sold and so forth. Okay? So this will significantly impact the field of toxicology. This is a newer form, not for the first non-genetic form of inheritance we've actually found. And so this will be in combination to the classic genetic inheritance we see, and these two things will actually contribute to what's actually going to go forward. Now this is a pretty doom and gloom thing. What your great-grandmother was exposed to is going to cause disease in you, and you're going to pass it on to your grandkids, and you can't really do anything about it. Okay? So, turns out if we have these biomarkers, these epi mutations, that link to what's, what was the exposure and what disease develops, essentially well, we can use those as diagnostics to tell you what your ancestors were. Uh, potentially, or what you were exposed to early in life, and what diseases you might be susceptible to get later in life. So those early stage diagnostics allow us to do preventative medicine, in the sense that now you can actually, in your 20s, get, a d get an analysis of your epigenome, determine potentially where you stand, if you actually have a susceptibility later on. In your 30s and 40s, there are a whole series of pharmaceutical treatments and lifestyle changes to suppress that the disease onset later on. And for example, if we knew that you were definitely going to get breast cancer, there are therapeutics that you can take to actually delay the onset of breast cancer by t to 10 to 15 years. Same thing for prostate. And so essentially, this, by simply knowing this exists in the epigenetic biomarkers, this might help us treat the disease. We can't fix it, but we can potentially treat it much more efficiently in the future. So it's not totally doom and gloom, even though it is somewhat depressing. Okay. Yeah. So the last thing I want to mention is evolutionary biology. So this is not just disease. It affects every, every, every area of biology. Okay? So we did, we've done a couple of experiments to actually show that the same potential mechanism we're talking about has a potential contribution for evolution as well. The first one we did, we did in collaboration with David Cruz at the University of Texas, uh, Austin. And he basically had the ability to look at sexual mate preference in rats or mice. And if you don't know, when Darwin, one of his first books that he wrote, Darwin, showed, he proposed that sexual selection, the plumage that a bird has, the, a bird has, the song that the bird has, so forth, that basically almost every species had a mate preference. Okay? And if you interfered with that, the proposal was that it, you would get an evolutionary sort of process change. So what we did is we did a series of behavioral effects, and we found that our F3 generation animals had a significant sh shift in their mate preference. Okay? So that was our first observation, that something that may be related to evolution. But that wasn't quite strong enough. So a few years ago, uh, in collaboration with Dale Clayton in Utah, who has been going to the Galapagos for a number of years looking at parasite invasion of the Darwin finch, we chose the Darwin finch. We took uh, five different species. They were in different, different sort of clades of, in, in the phylogenetic organization. Took their DNA and looked at for epigenetic changes and genetic changes between the species. And what we found was there was a higher, generally a higher number and a linear relationship with the epi mutations that were present. The epigenetic changes were also going on, but it wasn't quite as organized, but it was comparable. But we couldn't, it, what this did is it really showed us that you can't n simply only think about genetics. You're also going to have this epigenetics you need to think about that's per, sort of this program as well. And so this basically suggested that the two together would actually have a significant role in this case in that speciation process. So I proposed a fairly controversial thing last year. And the concept was Darwin, when he proposed, he said basically phenotypic variation the population, will play a significant role in natural selection, which is influenced by the environment, to get an adaptation and evolutionary process to go forward. Neo-Darwinian evolution came about when we started to understand a little more about molecular biology, where the DNA sequence and mutations in the DNA sequence was driving this phenotypic variation. Well, now we know that environment can actually influence the epigenetics, and these epimutations can regulate the genome DNA uh, uh, activity, and actually recently shown increased mutation rates. The ability of the environment to influence phenotype is a neo-Lamarckian concept, 50 years before Darwin. Okay? 
By putting these two together, you get a much better molecular understanding of how evolution might occur and how the environment may play a significant role in that process. Okay. So it's not just disease, it also could potentially have a role in evolution. So, essentially the epigenetics, which is very responsive to the environment in contrast to the genetics, sort of responding to this environment, the epimutations get in put in place for the uh, DNA, the gene expression sort of changes occur, changes the physiology of the tissue, and you get basically greater phenotypic variation in the individual. For that phenotypic variation, this has an influence on natural selection and evolutionary processes. And these epimutations that get put into your, become permanently programmed in your epigenome are those ancestral ghosts in your genome. So now you sort of understand the title, okay? And so that basically what we're sort of proposing in terms of how a much sort of broader view of the molecular control of biology. All right, so the last slide is probably the most important slide. Uh, this is a hardworking lab that I currently have, all those people that are working on it. I've also had 53 past trainees, mostly undergrads, and 35 graduate and postdoctoral fellows as well. And they're basically contributed too. But these are the people that do all the work. And they actually have really done the science to get us to there. I just get the luxury of actually talking about this, okay? So these are the ones that do all the hard work. And here's the funding agent, so. So with that, I'll be happy to finish and happy to answer any questions. Any questions? Sure. Uh, when you mentioned the biomarkers, um, how far off do you think um, that is uh, for people to do the sample and to um, have some idea of what their propensity for disease might be? Sure. So the question is, how far off are the biomarkers to actually look for things? Uh, there's a couple companies that are now are starting to do the diagnostics and epigenetics. The first one that'll probably come out is dealing with infertility in men. And so, but there's other ones coming on pretty quickly. So I suspect within five years, we will be, you will be able to go get a, maybe not all diseases, but some of the major diseases you'll be able to get a biomarker for. Okay. Uh, my, sorry, my question is that um, in terms of epigenetic uh, heritage, um, is it possible that um, uh, the uh, organism can be um, active about it, I mean, can be sm smart about it. Um, suppose there's a plant um, uh, experiencing uh, all kinds of drug uh, stress, mm -hmm. and uh, it's developed some mechanism to deal with it, like more wax on the leaf. Sure. Is it possible that without mutating its genome, or not by natural selection, sure. it, its heritage, uh, sure. its uh, progeny is going to get more wax when they are naturally born. So yes. the current concept in evolution, it's taken them a while to get there, is things are not predictive. So in other words, what you have is a phenotypic variation, and there will be a group of them at a certain phenotype that is more preferential or adaptive to whatever environment things going on. But it's not predictive in that that's what it gives you. By having the greater variation, gives you the ability to sort of have a set that's going to be more adaptive. And it's the same thing molecular-wise in terms of the epigenetics and the genetics. You really can't predict, the environment can't predict, here, here's what I want. It just creates a bigger variation. So that's the way I would view about it, view it, and uh, not such a, this predictive sort of thing. It's a small room, you can just yell. <laughs> just hard to move around. Um, Mike, you mentioned this, this vast component of this so-called epigenome mm -hmm. called histones and the markers <laughs> that occur on them. Sure, sure, sure. And as you indicated schematically, the, the number of variations there are astronomical. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just curious, have you or anybody else in, in these kinds of studies looked at some of the histone marks, and there's some very common ones, 
related to gene expression, and have you seen sure. this transgenerational effect? Sure. So first of all, I think all of the epigenetic markers or elements that I talked about, the structure, the histones, and the, all of them are going to play a role in this process. It's not just DNA methylation. DNA methylation was the first to be identified, and it has the most dramatic developmental sort of changes versus the other ones. But I think all of them are going to be important. Three labs in the past two years have taken sperm, promoting transgenerational things, and shown that there is retention of, the sp of a few histones, less than 5%, at certain sites. And those sites are very important in the early development. And so that was, those were the first observations that indeed histone modifications may also play a role in that early event as well. Not quite as dramatic as DNA methylation can be, but I think they will play a role. And recently, a s several different labs have shown that non-coding RNA in the sperm can get shifted from its earlier development, and then it's retained, and then it affects the early development as well. Uh, the DNA methylation is a thing that sort of goes forward, but I think all of them will have slightly different functions, but will be involved in the process. Uh, the other ones beyond DNA methylation are a little more difficult to look at. Now, the one that is intriguing is the egg. The egg doesn't have some of these developmental things as much as the sperm. It's sort of locked in meiosis this whole time during sort of adulthood until they ovulate. But to get enough eggs to do the epigenetics is really tough. And so there hasn't been as much work on eggs. There's been a few. But we know that many things will go through the female and not the male. For example, something I should have pointed out, remember I had 50% of, of obesity in both the male and female? The male line, the sperm, was passing on the female obesity, and the female line was passing on the male obesity. Okay? And so, so the egg's going to be involved in a number of things, which is harder to study. But I think all of the epigenetic components, including the histones, will be critical for it. Uh, uh, Mike, is there any evidence that uh, bacterial or viral infections might have some epigenetic effects? Right. Um, nobody's looked for the epigenetic component yet, but just recently, in the past two or three years, with these phenomena being known, now people are actually challenging models with infectious disease, and they've been finding transgenerational phenotypes. So I suspect that, that you, it's not because the infection can be seen as an environmental stressor. And it's at a, if it's at a critical time of development, particularly fetal development, it can clearly change how the epigenetics is programmed to influence that individual and become transgenerational. So I think it'll be an equally important environmental stressor. Thanks. That was a great talk. Thanks very much. Thanks. Um, two questions. Is, is there any evidence that at some point, at some generation, uh, we stop getting the transfer of, of the epigenetic effects? And the second question is, are there any um, environmental factors like nutrition or whatever that we know that might reverse this from happening, especially during sure. pregnancy or early sure. development? Thanks. So there's a whole bunch of things that have been shown, I'll just put up there. But essentially, um, to answer your question, the best examples, there was a f scientist, in the 17th, it's Linnaeus, basically. And Linnaeus, who did plant f uh, ta taxonomy, developed the field of taxonomy, like to, uh, over uh, nearly 200 years ago, had a flowering phenotype change due to heat exposure. And because he was Linnaeus, he actually kept the plant. Well, in the, in the late and early 2000s, uh, an investigator actually went back, got that original plant species, plus the current one that's been going 200 generations, has the same flowering abnormality or difference. And they tracked that this was due to an epimutation here, and it was back to that original. So that's a 200 generation sort of example. It's been shown now in plants, there's a 100 generation example, and there's about 200. And so it's harder to do that in animals and other species. But I think you're, what you're going to find is some of the non-genetic inheritance is going to be permanent. Now, other parts of it can be shifted by lifestyle and so forth, I think. But, so you're going to have an example of both, I think, going forward. Okay? And nutrition, by far, is probably the biggest exposure we see on a daily level. And so it's going to cause some. And, we, and a number of labs have shown nutrition, both caloric restriction, high-fat diet. Uh, now, in terms of a supplement, 
Everybody's excited about folate because folate is a methyl donor. And, and actually what they showed is during the exposure of a mouse model, if you put in the folate, you could inhibit the toxic substance actions, okay? But it was only during the exposure. If you did it afterwards, it wouldn't work. It was just, to, it would, so it, it, it fixed the exposure part of it, but subsequent transmission, no. But people are sort of looking at that sort of seriously in terms of whether there's a nutritional supplement or something. Now the problem with folate is, and you have to be careful, Folate's one of those vitamins that if you go more than like 150% of the daily sort of thing, the daily dose suggested, at about 200% or above, it becomes toxic. It's just as bad as the original toxicant. So you have to be very careful with folate because you can actually cause more problems than good. You have to stay within that daily dose and don't go above it. We have this concept because of vitamin C that we can take as much as we want and it's good for us. That's just a unique case of a vitamin where it doesn't matter. Right. Mike, uh, congratulations on the award, and I Thank also you. enjoyed your talk very much. Um, one of the um, biggest environmental exposures that uh, is resulting in adverse health outcomes are all of the stresses mm -hmm. that people are experiencing. Mm -hmm. um, and the students in my epidemiology course reading zebras, uh, you know, why zebras don't get ulcers by Sapolsky, uh, are learning that uh, one of the major drivers of stress are the glucocorticoids. Mm -hmm. And it would be interesting to know if the glucocorticoids at high concentrations that are the result of stress are, are, is also a driver in the epigenetics that you're describing here? Sure. So there's a fellow named Weissman back in about 1900, and what, what his major contribution to science was, it seems fairly minor today. The only cell that is gonna go from generation to generation is the germ cell, the sperm or the egg. Okay, so if you happen to get a change in your liver or your kidney or, or even your brain early in life, Yes, that potentially gives you a susceptibility later on to get a disease, but you cannot pass that to the next generation. You have to physically change the germ line to actually get something to go from generation to generation. So there's many things like a glucocorticoids, which in this critical period of development doesn't necessarily affect the germ line, but it will have dramatic effects on the fetus and its subsequent life but it may not be transgenerational. But frankly, as far as I know, no one's looked at glucocorticoids. Okay, so it's something that would need to be looked at. But there's no a prior uh, a reason to think in the gonad, you'd have a big effect. Uh, Mike, uh, on your slide here, that directly addresses my question for vinclozolin. You show these multiple pathologies that individuals can develop. Do you have right. an explanation for that? Are they always linked or is this random? So we've had this concept that here's a disease and now there's going to be a gene or two that's going to be involved in that disease. And then you go over here to this tissue and here's a disease, S different set of genes might be involved and so forth. So it's a very reductionist view uh, on how things work and, and a genetic determinist view. So there are going to be a series of tissues, the mammary gland, the prostate, the kidney and so forth that pretty much consistently have a susceptibility to develop disease, pretty much in any species, and in particular us. So my con I'm a, more of a systems biologist. So if you look at a mammary gland, and we have actually some evidence for this, and you changed 500 genes expression in that mammary epithelial cell, I don't care what 500 genes you have, you could randomly pick them, and they will increase the susceptibility of that tissue to get a disease, develop breast cancer. Okay? If you change the transcriptome that much, in many, this subtly in so the cells, the specific genes aren't so much the critical thing. Certain pathways and so forth might be, but it's not the specific genes. That's a very big diversion from what we've been thinking about where disease comes from. So I'm sort of over here, more systems, not so much this reductionist view and genetic determinist view. But this is a good, you can find out what some of the genes are and so forth in the process but those are not necessarily the causal agents. They're probably affecting a pathway or two, and it doesn't matter. You could affect five genes in that pathway and get the same phenotype. 
And that's what we see is usually 200 to 1,000 genes changing in these tissues. So it's not a minor change. And so that's why if you change that much going on, things like kidney disease, mammary tumors, breast prostate disease, they're pretty much linked. This is why in metabolic syndrome, you have so many t diseases that are linked to that. Okay. Right. <clears throat> Mike, I keep thinking about the remethylation during zygote development. Is there any information on how accurate that has to be? And if it has to be accurate, how is that guaranteed? Yeah, it has to be accurate because that drives your cell lineage. Yeah, that's whether it be thinking. a brain or an eye. And the reason that our brain and eye are different. If you think about it, we have 200 cell types in the body. They all have exactly the same DNA sequence. The thing that's different between those 200 cell types is the epigenetics is completely different between each cell yeah, type. Yeah, that's what I'm asking is Correct. what guarantees the methylation so, pattern. So it's a comp probably the genetics is to a large degree it's what's driving that. That early developmental thing from a stem cell, what genes are get turned on genetically in terms of the cascade, then affect, so then these things start getting, and you get this cascade going forward. And so to give you that normal process. But no tissue has been looked at in that degree. We've looked at the genetics for a number of them, but we haven't looked at the epigenetics. So it's very, it'd be very interesting to actually put those two together and look at the development. So the methylation pattern is important and is maintained even without a toxicant or a correct. stress. Correct, correct. So if you're a teenage girl or boy and your mammary gland starts to develop at the age of 12 or 13, okay, or your prostate for a male starts to develop, you hit that stem cell with an environmental toxicant like a bisphenol A or something for a period of a couple years, you then are gonna shift the epigenome of that early cell. And then that's gonna shift the transcriptome and that'll appear 30 or 40 years later give you a susceptibility to develop a disease in those tissues. So what you did is you took that normal cascade and shifted it because of the exposure. So developmental origins of disease concept and epigenetics really gives us a mechanism for that. Hi, um, thanks for the talk. Uh, my question is, I, I guess I'm, I'm hoping you could, if, I'm hoping you'll be able to speak to whether or not um, evolution or evolutionarily novel environmental toxins like jet fuel have different effects on the epigenome than more evolutionarily older um, toxicants, things like secondary plant compounds, things that we know we've been exposed to for a much longer time. Sure. So historically, we've always yeah. had in, in toxicant sort of things. In plants, the reason for that disease shift from Japan to North America was that soy has a very high level of genistein, which is an estrogenic endocrine disruptor, an anti-estrogenic sort of factor. And so if you have high levels of soy in your diet, you're getting that exposure to that phytoestrogen, and that changes your physiology. In North America, we eat grains, and we don't see that so much. So you move this to a different diet sort of thing, you're going to see that shift. So for, since the beginning of time, for the human sort of race, we've had these sort of things going on. What we've seen over the past 100 years or 50 years is the number of these environmental toxins now are just going through the roof. And each one can contribute. So yes, all of these things, unless we can clean it up really quickly, we're going to have an, a major evolutionary sort of advantage, a million to a years down the line potentially in the human race going forward. Okay, so it, it's not that what we see is sort of that novel. We're making a lot more man-made toxicants, and we're going to have to deal with that. Okay. Thank you for the oh. thank you for the talk. Uh, little comment on that. Uh, can plants be smart uh, about epigenetic inheritance? Uh, there are a couple studies uh, for last few years that plants can actually have epigenetic inheritance, especially for TMV defense responses and yeah. pseudomonas. I think a couple Canadians group did studies, so that's already been proven. Uh, my question is, how many compounds, just approximation, uh, already been tested for transgenerational uh, inheritance up to date? Like up for mammals, yeah. Yeah. So for mammals, in terms of environmental sort of things, 25 or 30 different environmental sort of things going forward. Uh, for plants, uh, th which there is a pretty good literature developing on, there's at least 
10 different environmental stressors. The majority of them are more in the drought and, and water sort of, uh, sort of situation, temperature sort of thing. But there's now newer ones that are actually do using it in terms of chemicals and things as well. So the numbers are growing. And just to comment, almost all of epigenetics, even the transgenerational stuff, was actually initially observed in plants. It wasn't in mammals or animals. It was early initially observed in plants. So plants are the, m the model system that really brought those to, to attention. Ten years before they looked at it in mammal, they started studying epigenetics in plants. Please join me in thanking uh, Dr. Skinner for this excellent presentation. Thank you very much. I wanted to let the members of the audience know that there's going to be a reception in Dr. Skinner's honor just outside the auditorium here in the lobby. Thank you for joining us today.